you see death a lot in intensive care. You see it every day. And there was an incident with a man who was dying and he had a really prolonged suffering death. And it really upset me. And I nearly gave up nursing as a result. And it just made me think, what is death all about? Is death that bad that we've got to subject patients to this awful treatment at the end of their life? And I thought if we understood death better, perhaps we wouldn't, you know, we'd be able to treat people differently as well. So I started learning about death and I read loads of books on death. And um, then I came across near-death experiences. And at first I was really very, very kind of skeptical about them. And I just thought, you know, it's got to be the brain as the brain is shutting down as it's approaching death. You know, it's a, something's happening there and it's creating these hallucinations or illusions. But the more I read about them, the more interested I became. And um, then I started seeking out people who'd had an experience. Like I can remember my friend said, oh, my auntie had one of those experiences. So I said, well, can I go and have a chat with her? So I had a chat with her and then I just got to speak to more and more people. And I thought, God, this is really fascinating to me. I'm working in intensive care. It's the ideal place where it can be studied. So um, after a series of little synchronicities, I ended up studying near-death experiences then at the University of Wales in Lampeter. And I had Professor Paul Badham and Dr. Peter Fenwick as my supervisors. And for five years, I interviewed patients who survived their admission to the intensive care unit. And then it took me then about three years to analyze the data and to write it up. But I wanted to find out, you know, were these just due to the drugs? Because we give a lot of potent drugs in the intensive care unit. Was it due to lack of oxygen, which was the, a lot of the theories that had been proposed and high levels of carbon dioxide? And were they the same as hallucinations? And that's what I was looking at with my study. And also how common are they as well? You know, are they associated with just a particular illness or do you have to have a cardiac arrest to have the experience? And what I found is that people with all different kinds of illnesses and injuries, they, they could have a near-death experience. So it wasn't just cardiac arrest survivors, although it is more prevalent in people who've survived cardiac arrest. Um, I didn't find the drugs to be the cause of the experience and in fact I found the opposite really. When I analysed the data, the patients who had been given a large amount of drugs and painkilling and sedative drugs, they were less likely to report a near-death experience and maybe had some elements but it was almost as if it was turning an experience into something confusional. So with um, those patients who'd had drugs, they were likely to have hallucinations. And what I did is I documented the ones who had been hallucinating. And when I analysed both sets of experiences, there were clear differences between the patients who'd been hallucinating and the patients who'd been reported the near-death experience. So, for example, with the near-death experience, it followed a kind of pattern. And afterwards, the patients were adamant that it was a real experience. You know, they said it was realer than real. And unless you've had this experience for yourself, you just can't understand it. Whereas when I followed up the group who had been hallucinating, what I found is that these patients could rationalize that they'd been hallucinating and they were a little bit embarrassed by their behavior as well, you know? And then when I analyzed what they'd said about their hallucinations and I went back to the nurses who were looking after them at the time, it was obviously things that were going on in the background. So it was the, new, the staff conversation, the noises, the monitors alarming, all of those kinds of things contributed to these hallucinations. Whereas the near-death experience, it wasn't influenced by what was going on around the patient. So, you know, it was a fascinating study to do. And all of the proposed materialist theories just didn't adequately explain this experience. And so, for me, I think the, what we need to do is have a deeper understanding of consciousness. And I think the materialist perspective that the brain produces consciousness it's outdated, it's wrong, and I think it needs to be revised and expanded. And we need to look at alternate explanations of what consciousness is. And to me, this is really fascinating. You know, it's 
we are at the brink of discovering new things about what it means to be human. Um, but, you know, there has been a lot of resistance over the years. You know, a lot of people have kind of um, been very sceptical of these experiences, although that is changing, thankfully. I have seen attitudes change quite drastically, uh, and that's really encouraging as well. But um, to me, it's, it's a really exciting time to be alive because we're making such new discoveries now, you know. And if you think about it, I started doing my research back in 1997 and um, there's not many studies being done. So, you know, this is a, a whole research area which is begging hope for more people to go and do some more research and replicate what I have done and what people like Dr. Sam Parnier have done. You know, we need more and more research to find out the answers to these questions because when I started my research I think I was really quite naive because I thought at the end of this five years of interviewing patients I was going to come out and I was going to have all the answers but in, you know what I, what I found was that it's raised more questions and it's answered and there is so much that we don't know and don't understand but that's the exciting thing it's it's finding out and making these new discoveries isn't it you know it is. I mean, with with science, proper science is it, that's what you want. You want more questions to be raised, because if you've got all the answers, then science is you don't need it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. And I think the problem is, is people are so concerned with having science as we currently understand it being correct that anything that goes beyond that is kind of it doesn't work. It's not true because it doesn't fit with what we currently know. But yes. that's what we currently know. Exactly, that's and it. The whole, yes, and the whole idea of science is to go beyond what we currently know to find things that we didn't know. So we've got to be very flexible with, you know, understanding that we're more than likely wrong with what we know. Yeah. In fact, almost certainly wrong. Yeah, and I think we've just gone along with this idea that the brain produces consciousness because there's been no reason to kind of challenge that view. But now that near-death experiences and similar kind of experiences are being studied in the clinical area and in other ways, I think it's raising, you know, the, the fact that we don't know the answers. And rather than just dismissing these experiences now, you can't explain near-death experiences away. You can't just dismiss them anymore. We have to take them seriously and look for alternative explanations. And I think for me, since doing this research, the the most plausible explanation is that the brain, rather than creating um, these experiences, the, the consciousness is primary and it's around us all the time, but we're not aware of it in its true heightened state. And it's almost like the brain acts like a kind of filter. So it only allows us to perceive things in certain ways. And I think there are certain times in our life when that filter action of the brain, it expands or it, it's not, doesn't have that rigid hold like it did with the filtering. And so this experience of this heightened state of consciousness is allowed into our everyday reality then. And so that makes much more sense to me. You know, the brain is a transceiver of consciousness rather than a producer of consciousness. And then that gives us a whole other avenue to go off and explore as well. So, you know, we're on the brink of making these new discoveries about consciousness. And to me, it's just fascinating. You know, it's such an interesting topic and I could learn about it all the time, you know. So Yeah, and, it, and it's the most foundational thing to our experience. Yes. Isn't it? Consciousness. Everybody's the only thing we know is that yeah. we, we're conscious. So to know more about it is surely... And I don't understand, you know, the whole concept of death and being taboo and all that. People don't like to talk about it. I don't. That doesn't make sense to me because it's the only certain thing. Yes. You know, in everybody's like, life. That's it. You know, when I started doing my research, everyone said to me, "Oh, Penny, that's really morbid. Why are you mm. doing that? It's, this is really boring and morbid." But it's not. It's fascinating. And since learning about death, it's actually opened things. That opened my eyes. You know, it's taken the blinkers off for me and all of a sudden I have this new awareness of things that I would never have learned about. These experiences were never in my nurse training at all. But to me, it's essential that we have knowledge about these experiences because we're dealing with dying patients. And 
You know, it, it's not a, a morbid subject at all. This is something that is of relevance to everyone, you know. It's a very important subject. So it's something we all need to learn, learn about. That's it. And the thing is, you know, life is always polar opposites, isn't there? So if you're using science to learn about life, you've got to use it to learn about death as well to get the full scope of what life is, because they go hand yes. in hand. That's right, absolutely. And as you said, you know, death is your, the, the thing that's certain for absolutely every one of us. And to me, I, I want to know more about it. I, I want to know what, what's going to happen to me when I die. I don't want to put you know, it's like otherwise we're just burying our heads in the sand and not learning about these things, you know. Yeah, just trying to pretend it's not going to happen. Mm, that's right. Yeah, that's it. And it is. And so for me, I think it's changed my outlook on everything because... Before, I think, I, I don't know what sort of world I was living in before, but I think, you know, mundane things, you know, just going shopping and spending money on the latest gadgets and things like that, you know. And then all of a sudden, it's not about that at all. It's about making the most of what you have, you know, and na- being out in nature as well. The things that don't cost money turn out to be the most important things as well, you know. That's right, yeah. I think it's difficult with with studies and especially things like this because people will look for solid someone's come out of their body and they've seen a hidden target or something and um, it's never happened so people say it, well then that's clearly BS you know or yeah. it's, it's all in their minds because they haven't seen that so I don't know what, what do you think about that well yeah that's a, it's such a difficult thing because that's another thing I tried to do with my my study is verify if that out of body component was accurate and if it was verifiable and what I did is I hid these hidden targets they were all on multicolored day glow colored uh, card they were run they were on top of the cardiac monitor at, at each patient's bedside and that was mounted off the wall so it was about eight foot from the ground and they were concealed behind ridges so the only way you could view it is if you'd left your body but what i found was really interesting although none of the patients actually viewed the symbol i found that the outer body experience had varying qualities so some patients just floated a little bit above their body and they only maybe about three or four foot above were looking down some of them then floated into the middle of the room which is opposite to where they were hidden and then there were two patients out of the eight who had this experience. Those two patients had the type of experience where they were high enough out of their body to view the symbols. But both of those patients said, I was so interested in looking at what was going on around my body. I wasn't looking around the unit. And I, But one of them said, if you'd have told me beforehand that there was something there, I'd have gone up there and looked at it. But you know, interestingly, you know, the, one of them had a particularly accurate experience um, where he reported everything that was done to him. And during that time, he was deeply unconscious. So, you know, he shouldn't really have any recollection at all of that. But clearly, he was out of his body and he was aware of what we were doing. But he was deeply, deeply unconscious. So, mm. As far as all the, um, all the gadgets and everything was telling you, he shouldn't have been conscious. Yeah. yeah, right, he should be recollected. <clears throat> what he he reported was a heightened state of reality as well. There was nothing confusional about it at all. It was very precise. He correctly identified the doctor who examined him when he was unconscious, although prior to losing consciousness, that doctor hadn't even been on duty. So, you know, it's incredible. It really is fascinating. Mm. I mean, the, a, co- a common explanation is that, you know, well, these people are near death, they're not dead. And just because the EEG graph or whatever isn't showing signs that the brain is still going to be active until they're dead. But the way I see it is the thing is, everything that we that we know about how the brain works is telling us that at that point consciousness should not yeah. exist at all. Regardless of whether the brain's still active or not, that person should not be aware, but they are. Yeah. So the question is, you know, is this because the brain's still working behind the scenes doing something? Which I'd say no, because at that point, all it's concerned with is keeping the heart going and keeping unconscious things going. But conscious experience is kind of a secondary thing. So is it just some anomaly of the brain we don't understand, or is it possibly that we're wrong and then there's something else? Yeah, it could well be. Yeah, that's it. Mm. We. We simply don't know. But there again, you know, I've nursed thousands and thousands of patients who've been unconscious. And when they come round from being unconscious, 
they can be very confusional, you know, it, they can be very confused and disorientated and very vague. But the people who'd had the near-death experience, they were very, they had this great clarity of thought and great lucidity with the way in which they were reporting it, which is a total contrast to patients who were just coming round from being unconscious. So it's just something we don't understand at the moment. And we need to have an open mind about this as well. That's right. Another thing that I struggle to <laughs> to get my head around as well, if consciousness is primary and non-reliant on physical matter, then why does anaesthetic take it away? I know, but that's another thing, isn't it? It's fascinating. I don't know. You know, I really don't know. But um, Stuart Hammeroff, he's um, he's an anaesthetist as well. And, yeah, he's, you know, him and his microtubules. That's right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know why it is, but it's... That's the fascination, you know, the mystery of the human body as well, you know, so much. That's it. And the way it should be approached is not, this is evidence against <laughs> against what we believe, but it should be something that, you know, is a new thing to look at and look into. Not just say, this is it, That's it makes everything else BS. It should be, <laughs> so if this is true, what about this? Let's have a look. I mean, the way the way I see it is that you know, the consciousness is still attached to the brain in a living body, mm-hmm. and so it's still trying to filter through that brain. And if that's made yeah. unavailable, it's it's. But you know, that whole thing is again about the experience of non-consciousness. Mm-hmm. You, you can't perceive it because it doesn't. You've never had that experience. You've just had before and after. Yes. So in between, how can you perceptualize nothing? You can't. Mm, exactly yeah that's right and you know death is a process as well you know it's not just as instant although it isn't it isn't the cells although the the person has has died the cells are still dying their own death as well you know so it is a it's a slow process if you read um, dr sampania's last book the lazarus effect i think it was called you know he, he talks about it being a process and that's an important point you know so i'm and is it that we've got um, lack? There's, there's no sensory input. So when patients are, say, for example, in cardiac arrest, there's no sensory input there. So perhaps they're experiencing things in its purest form. Then you know, with no sensory input to to kind of um, influence what they're experiencing. So That's right. Yeah, and it's difficult again to understand, isn't it? Mm. That that what we experience isn't things as they are, they're things as the way we, our brains can perceive them to be. That's right. Which is, um, I can't remember his name, the guy that came up with the, the theory of the um, holographic universe, where, and, and if you look, it's true, because the way we perceive the world is only as far as we can interpret it. We're yes. looking at information. Tom Campbell was another one, wasn't he? Yes, Tom Campbell's written those. Yeah. yeah. That everything is just information and it's the way it's interpreted creates the world that we see and that's right you know a shrimp is going to have a completely different world because yeah. they have different perceptions yeah that's right yeah mm. and it's just fascinating to think you know, to explore this further as well you know it really is there's so many different theories out there as well and and i just find it really exciting to me this i feel really passionate about this subject because it just Oh, it just is really quite amazing. Hmm. And think of the implications if we were to find this stuff to be true, what that would mean. Yeah. It'd mean the right. fear of death can disappear entirely. Absolutely. And we can be a lot more productive. I mean, the out of body experience is something I'm actively trying to achieve myself through um, Robert Monroe's CD, the Monroe Institute. Yeah, right. I know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm working on that. I've, I've had a few strange experiences, but I've never come out yet because that's something I want to do because I'm, I'm a scientist I like to validate things exactly yeah and, I tell you yeah. who do you, know, do you know of Graham Nichols I've got an interview with him hopefully at some point he's great he's, yeah. he's good and he teaches these techniques as well Graham does and uh, he's had the out of body experiences himself so yes yeah yeah I've bought, I've bought his book I'm working my way through that he seems like a really nice guy I need a once I've read the book, I need to get in contact. If you're watching, Graham, I'm still I'm coming for you. <laughs> I, I know, I know him. He's a really nice guy. Yeah, he's great. He'd be really helpful to you. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I hope I hope he'll 
get in touch because that would be that'd be great. Ver- I mean, verified things is, is where I, as I say, being a scientist, I like proof of things. Which is, and if I was to ever achieve this out of body thing and was to see a verified event, never mind proving it to the rest of the world, I'm settled. Yeah, that's you know. it. Mm. And that, that's the kind of thing that I found with my research as well. You know, I could, I know what I saw with my my own eyes, and you know the findings that I came across and everything. I know. So you know, for me, I've satisfied my curiosity, and it's in fact, it's made my curiosity grow. Um, and I've written it all up as my thesis has been published, so that if there's other researchers who have got that curiosity as well and who want to continue, they can follow you know, and um, do their own study as well, you know, because I would encourage so many more people to go and do your own study. You know, it's one thing to read about it from a book, but it's and something else to actually be there while these experiences are happening. That's it. And if you don't do that, there's too many people now that will discount something and then you say, well, have you ever tried it yourself? No, I don't need to because I know it's bullshit. Yeah, you know? that's it. And it's always peddled, you know, our peer-reviewed scientific papers, um, James Randi and his million dollar whatever that is and yeah. whatever else you know anecdotal evidence isn't evidence nonsense yeah I know, I know. yeah but well thankfully attitudes are changing now as well and people are waking up to these things and people are more curious and you know when I started doing the research attitudes were so dismissive you know back in 1997 everyone was just kind of poo-pooing it and just saying it was a load of rubbish but then after I finished it, it was a totally different case. And now, you know, all those years later, again, the attitudes are much, much, it's much more widely ex- um, accepted and people are now willing to do more research in it as well. That's it. And it, it takes an experience of, uh, an experience of your own or a study of your own to actually to do that. I mean, yeah. even I remember when I was a kid, I was all very, you know, all this spirit stuff was nut jobs and whatever. And it was always the same, but I ended up having depression when I was 12, when I got to the suicidal state, had a complete mental breakdown. And since then, you know, I had the choice, do I either take my own life or do I look into more things and try and figure out what's going on? And, and from that experience, I started looking at it. And again, it's the same as you. It, you grow an interest and you start to realise that we don't know everything. Exactly. That's right. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, there's a, now that you mentioned that, there's a really good book in, that might interest you is um, Breaking Down is Breaking Through by Dr. Russell Razak. And that's really interesting. And he looks at um, some issues in mental illness as actually being breaking through, you know, and waking up is a spiritual awakening. So um, that's a fascinating thing as well. You know, that really interests me a lot. Mm. I mean, you know, with the spiritual side of things, obviously there's a lot of things that just have gone beyond what's what's right you know i mean i I don't know about things like um dowsing and crystals and i don't know i've never looked into it but dowsing crystals that sort of thing seems a bit i don't see how it could work and these people with crystal balls and all that i don't subscribe to that sort of stuff but then i haven't i haven't looked at it yeah, it's, that's quite interesting because I, I hadn't really heard much about it and dowsing. I, I can remember with it when I was a kid, you know, seeing some guy with these rods moving them back and forth and I just thought, oh, that's his hand. But but um, in recent years, I've come across a few people who were really quite accurate with dowsing as well. So that's kind of opened my eyes as well, you know, and made me think, oh, perhaps there's more to this than we mm. realise as well. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the problem is it's so easy to discount something without having yeah, looked the- into it yourself because you're set in your ways and that's, that's the difference you've got to be willing to think yeah. is there something to it or is it and go and have a look don't exactly. just come up to a conclusion and on your don't own. believe everything either you know you've got to question everything that's the most important thing that's right a good good example is david ike and his, mm. his reptile theory something that everyone would say is is nonsense i can't believe it but then i'll say i haven't studied yeah. it for 40 years like he has i don't know i don't have a clue they might be. who knows you know yeah that's right yeah especially when we're talking about multiple dimensions and things like that different levels of consciousness you don't yeah. know yeah. okay so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of explanations for near-death experiences now, or attempted ex- explanations, isn't there? Anoxia yeah. and chemical. I mean, they, they said um, I can't remember the the guy's name who studied it, but he was able to 
replicate parts of the outer body experience, especially by stimulating the. Oh, is that Michael Pussing there? Is it with the god? That's him. That's that's the yeah, guy. Yeah, and that's interesting. Helmet, yeah. And it could be that there's many triggers to trigger in this experience. You know, it doesn't have to be near death. And as you know, by nature of the fact that these patients have actually come back to life means that they haven't completely died as well. So you know, it's perhaps it's a route to accessing this deep altered state of consciousness, and that's just one route of it as well. You know, but then with there was. Um, a team of Swiss scientists who tried to replicate Persinger's um, experiments as well, and they didn't get the same results as what he did as well. So, you know, you're gonna look at, at all avenues. Yeah, really. and that's it. You, you can't cherry pick mm. information that confirms what you think. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Because I wonder. And they say a lot, a lot of things. They can see that all this is related to the brain because they can see that when this happens the brain reacts but does does that mean we should equate that to that's what's causing it or that's just having an effect on it yeah exactly it, it could just be the effect you know we're looking you know there's a difference between causations and correlations and so i think that's a mistake that's been happening from the materialist perspective is that people have been confused causations with correlations so that's something as well for future researchers to take on board as well, you know. Mm. Every piece of evidence I've seen that suggests that the brain creates consciousness, brain damage and, and everything else like that, to me, I, I can easily put that forward also as evidence of a receiver theory. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you if you if you hit a radio with a hammer, I always say, what's going to happen? The, the sound's going to come out distorted or it's going to stop working entirely. The source is still there but the, the material that is filtering it has been damaged but the radio yeah. isn't creating it there's two exactly. conclusions yeah mm. that's it and i think that's just you know the way that our we've progressed you know with not questioning that theory just accepting it as the brain produces consciousness and now we've got to this state where actually no it doesn't fit and just because it doesn't fit it doesn't mean that near-death experiences and all these other anomalous experiences are wrong you know it's it, there's something about these experiences that can give us a different understanding or a deeper understanding of consciousness That's and right. it's about or in different perspectives now and different mm. explanations instead of looking at maybe there's faults with the conclusion that people are coming to maybe there's faults with the methodology we're using because that methodology is based off of what we currently understand as and taking the assumption that that's correct yes that's right and you know the the, the brain is a transceiver it's not a new kind of uh, theory it's just one that was never kind of developed you know Henri Bergson talked about that or does Huxley talked about it you know it's been talked about for years and years ago it's just never really been kind of taken much notice of you know mm. now I was watching an interview with um, Michael Shermer all right. He's a very clever guy, and he, he was saying you could tell he, he'd got kind of not the right idea of what we were saying when he, he was saying, and quite right, you know, he was saying, well, how uh, how can we find this consciousness, whatever it is, where is it, and when people die, where does this does this you're saying this consciousness lifts off the brain? Well, how does that happen? And I'm thinking, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying it lifts off the brain. We're saying it disconnects. It, it's always there. It just doesn't have the function to do it. It doesn't lift off physically or whatever. Yeah. But he's right in the sense of how can we how can we assume that this is correct if we can't measure it? Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And, and that's the question, really. How That's the difficulty in how we, we don't understand it because at the moment it's beyond a way of measuring. And, wow, I, yeah, that's the ultimate question, isn't it? Mm. How do we capture conscious? And is the conclusion, therefore, if we can't measure it, it, there's two possible outcomes in there. If we can't measure it, either A, it doesn't exist, or B, the, our capability of measuring it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, that's it. And of course, yeah. when you compare the evidence, most people are going to come to the, to the assumption that it doesn't exist, because the evidence points to the fact that the brain creates consciousness yeah. for a lot of people, and therefore another stream of consciousness coming into the brain isn't needed. Yeah, exactly. But the problem but then, is, is, yeah... But, you know, you can compare that to love and, you know, how do you measure love? 
you can't you can't measure love but you know i don't think anyone would deny that it, it exists so you know mm. you've got to think of things like that then as well yeah that's right and the problem is when you when you stick to this sort of idea there's so many anomalous experiences like the near-death experience the uh, validated out-of-body experiences psi things things like that that don't they don't agree with that which is either suggesting that our current theory is, is incorrect which seems the most plausible to me or that everybody the millions of people that are telling this anecdotally are all either wrong or liars yeah exactly that's a, that's a huge number of people to be lying or wrong it is absolutely yeah and i i just think it's you know it's quite an outdated thing now to have this belief that the brain produces consciousness and i think a lot of people are coming around to it but unfortunately you know that is still the predominant paradigm and that's what's taught in universities and schools and things you know so but what you're seeing is these a lot of the younger doctors coming through and nurses are aware of near-death experiences now and hopefully in the future it's the younger doctors that will change things as well mm. I mean, it's like, I suppose, in a way, I, I don't know, but from my experience, it's like starting a business. You know, you're taught how to start a business at school. You're taught about your finances. You're taught about marketing and all that sort of stuff. And you've got, right, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And this is from my, I've had three businesses that have all failed. But, um, I and then you go and start a business and you, and you realise, Christ, there's so much more to it that they yeah. haven't taught you. And it's the same with science. They're teaching you what we know, but they're not teaching you how to... That's right. How to look beyond it, and when you go and you know work in an intensive care unit like yourself, and you're taught, you know, you're unconscious at this point. You do the when you have an experience like a near death experience come up, you've never been taught that, and it doesn't fit with what you've been taught. So you think, what do I do? Yeah. You know, exactly. And, and the reaction of a lot of um, people is to just say to the patients, "Oh, you know, you had a lot of drugs. It was the drugs," and that's probably the worst thing that they can tell a patient because. The patient knows that they've experienced something really profound which is beyond any other human experience they've ever had and all of a sudden they di- it's just dismissed and so the worst thing and so what they do is tend to they clam up then they'll never talk about it again and, um, so then they're left then trying to figure out what happened to them you know some people have never even heard of these experiences and it can be years and years later they may come across something on or read something in a, a magazine and they'll think oh my gosh that happened to me I didn't realize it happened to other people and then that can set them on another part of their journey then as they where yeah. they try to get more so. that's right I mean when it comes to people saying you know it's you, you it was in your head or whatever I suppose we've got to take into, into account that there's going to be influences from the mind onto that near-death experience you know people that are Christian or whatever We'll see Jesus. Uh, Hindus will see Hindu gods. But yeah. does that does that mean that it's all in their head, or does it mean that their mind is influencing part of that experience? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. So I know it's, it's as if um, so you broke up a bit then, so I just got a bit lost. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they they are you know culturally. Um, influenced as well and people all have different connections or uh, you know different uh, perceptions of things and um, it's almost like you know uh, Carl Jung's theory of archetypes and the collective unconscious so it's as if the, you know these people what they're doing is accessing the collective unconscious and they're interpreting it with images that they're familiar with according That's to right. the yeah. and you've so, got you know Tom Campbell and um, William Buellman talking about consensus realities which are created on the expectations and belief systems of of people so it's likely that people are seeing jesus or whatever because that's what would make them most comfortable to interpret if they came down they saw a spirit a being of light with no shape whatever they wouldn't have a clue what the hell that was but seeing jesus they know that they're experiencing something divine to put it that way yeah Mm. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily su- uh, suggest that this is all just hallucination. No, it's it's much more than hallucinations, you know. And and some of the patients as well in my study, one man in particular, patient nineteen, he gained information. No, not patient nineteen. 
can't remember which one. Anyway, I know his name. Um, that this particular patient I'm thinking of gained information during the time that he was unconscious. Um, that he were through in ways other than through the senses. So he was deeply unconscious. He had this conversation with a dead relative who told him a family secret. And when he revived, he gave this information to his living relatives. And they were absolutely astounded that he should know that information because it was something they'd gone through for great lengths to keep a secret from him. And that was verified by the patient's wife. And she said, there's no way anyone's told him that. There's no way he could have known about it, but he did. And uh, similarly, um, I came across a lady called Ramsha Benamore in 2013, and we both spoke at this conference in Marseille. And she had a near-death experience, and this woman had a, her own business in retail. And, um, oh, my battery's running out, yeah. And um, when she was... Um, unconscious she had this experience where she had a life review back to the time of her birth and also back to the time of the universe and um, after the experience one of the after effects was this deep-seated knowledge of quantum physics and she'd never seen it before you know and her, she went to university as a result of her experience then and um, her university professor he was interviewed as part of the conference. He said, I don't know how she has this knowledge because it's deep-seated knowledge that you couldn't acquire through just reading books. And, You'd have to study for a while, yeah. Yeah, and he said some of the papers that she'd written um, since studying her course were beyond his own knowledge, but they had been verified by recent publications in physics journals. So, mm. you know, how do you explain that? That's right, and you can't. And the problem is, you know, that though both of those stories are very suggestive but people will say it's, an it's anecdotes it's stories yeah yeah that's it and instantly you've closed it off you know what if it yeah it's anecdotal but what if it's true just think about that what does that imply right you know. I know why aren't people more interested I'm trying to find a better PowerPoint <laughs> proof. What, what I'd like to do if, if that's all right is I've, I've got up a website a skeptic website here about uh -huh. your your study and all that. So if we run through some parts of that and the explanations, mm -hmm. and see what how that sort of holds water. So let's have a look here. Uh, I've never actually looked at this before. So, yeah. so patient twelve mm -hmm. so sustained That's severe right. chest trauma, a liver tear, and a fractured right humerus following a road uh, traffic accident. Yeah. So what happened there? Uh, yeah, he was unconscious for days, and then he recalled then afterwards. Um, this experience, I can't even remember what it was now, I'd have to go back to that particular thing, but he recalled some interesting things. I think he saw his grandfather, and prior to death, his grandfather had been had, had a stroke, but during the experience, he looked radiant and whole again. Um, and what else was it about him? And yeah, he had this injury as well, and that healed remarkably quickly, despite the fact that his arm was never in... Um, it wasn't held in a sling, and he had lots of inotropic drugs, which um, reduced the circulation as well. Right. So, I so there was, it shouldn't have healed, yeah. Yeah, put, yeah. He didn't need to go for surgery then to correct that healing, because it had already healed, so right. that was it. Yeah, let's just see what they've put here. So, when the orthopaedic surgeon went to repair the patient's fractured arm following his discharge from the ITU, the, ex the fracture had already healed. Yeah, Patient 12 reported that the surgeon was surprised of this as it was a severe break. The only explanation the, service could, the surgeon could offer is the patient had had head, head injury. Patients usually heal quickly, blah, blah, blah. So then they've gone on and they've said, so let's look at this the sceptical way, and they've said, right, he had a fractured arm, uh, he, and question mark, yeah, he was in a hospital and they already gave him treatment, so I think healing took place and there is no need to invoke a supernatural force at work. Unusual things can happen. Also, I believe when someone else would see the files and reports, then the fracture would look less severe, because I believe Sartori has her own bias, which I will point out later on. Well, 
go and work as a nurse in intensive care, mm. whoever that was, first of all, mm. and have a look and see what he thinks then. Because the treatment he had was were for the severe injuries where he ne- that he nearly died from. And when you've got someone who's in multi-organ failure, a fracture on their elbow is not a priority. It's the things that's, that are going to kill that patient. And so, although it, it obviously, you know, it was um, not ignored, but the other things were what took priority. And um, yeah, so, and and by the time he was out of intensive care, then that, when the plan was to go back to theatre to have that uh, fracture repaired. But when the x-ray was done on the ward, the, the surgeon said, well, there's no need to do it, it's healed. So that was it. Yeah. I mean, it's true that unusual things do happen on occasion, but, you know, for a compound fracture like that, you would have thought some intervention would have been needed. You know, it's not it's not a, a bent ear or something. It's a break broken bone, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. The one that I found interesting that I was looking at in a couple of your interviews before on Skeptico and whatever was the... Um, I can't remember which patient number it was, but the guy that had the hand. Um, yeah. yeah. So what, now, yeah. what happened there? Well, he is the strongest case in the study, but with his hand, um, he had cerebral palsy. So he was 60 years of age at the time of his experience, and his hand had been in that kind of permanently contracted position. He had he could move it like this, but he'd never been able to have much use yeah. of it. Yeah. And then after the experience, when I was doing an in-depth interview, he misinterpreted one of my questions. And he said, oh, look, I can open up my hand. And he went like that. And at the time, I didn't really understand how significant this was. It was only later when I was discussing this with the doctors and the physios. And they said, no, that shouldn't be possible. If this man has had cerebral palsy, that those tendons would be in that permanently contracted position for 60 years of his life. So in order to go like that, he would have to have surgery to release those tendons. And I checked on his notes to see if he'd had extensive hand physio or anything like that, but nothing he hadn't. And no one can explain how that's happened. So to me, that is fascinating and interesting because how many millions of other people out there have got similar ailments? And if we understood how that man was able to open his hand from going like that to that without surgery, how many the other... implications are huge, yeah. <clears throat> Oh, how we could, you know, there could be a whole <clears throat> way of treating these people who have these ailments. So, you know, that to me, that is just something that sparks even more curiosity. And why yeah. aren't uh, he, he, he was he? Sorry, and he had cerebral palsy since he was born, did he? Yes, yeah. So six, 60 years like that, and yeah. overnight, just like you know, that. it doesn't that doesn't fit, does it? Not at all. And I actually spoke to um, his sister and she's written a signed statement to say that he'd never been able to open out his hand like that all of his life. Hmm. So, and the change was directly after his near-death experience, like a day or so after? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and, and before that near-death experience he was... He was like that, yeah. And that so, that. right. So he was like that, he had a near-death experience and then he was like that. So what changed in between there? He had the near-death experience. Yeah. So surely there's a correlation, there must be. Mm. Well, yeah, there, there is, but we don't know how that's happened. But it's like no one else really wants to know either. But, but you, well, why not? You know, well, it's, fa- it, it's incredible. You, you, you do this, you have a, well, you don't do this, but you, you, you like this. You have a spiritual experience and all of a sudden, all of our physical understanding of medicine and whatever is gone because yeah. that shouldn't that shouldn't happen yeah. so there's something going on that we that doesn't fit with what we know so how can you not how can you just dismiss that you know i know i know that's right mm. yeah so it just fascinates me really that people are not more curious really because we could you know we could make these big evolutionary steps mm. yeah I mean, you know, physically, I think human beings have evolved as far as we can. I think it's it's, it's a spiritual and mental mm-hmm. evolution next. Yeah. I'm just looking through here. You can find any other examples? Uh, fractured arm. Done that one. Patient eleven. I can't remember that. 
Holmes. Who gained information during his NDE that was he was previously unaware of. He had a conversation with his deceased granddaughter who gave him a message for her mother. Oh, that's the one I was talking about just now, yeah. Right. So, here we go, the response. She claims that he was not aware that her daughter visited mediums, <laughs> but I think that this is not true because someone else is claiming that he knew about mediums. Uh, Penny Sartori's study. Patient 10, who's going to read up separately. Yeah. Patient 11, previously mentioned in the French Sartori thread. Oh, okay. For those who don't remember, the information brought back by the patient was that his daughter had visited psychics more than once. Previously, he knew that she had visited a psychic at least once. Oh, let me think. Um... Yeah, maybe in the past she had, and then he didn't want her to, so she kept it a secret, and she was going right. back seeing them regularly. And um, he had warned her he didn't want her to go and see mediums, and she was going anyway. And then that was the message that came back, because the granddaughter had said, tell her to stop going, because she keeps going back and forth to seeing them. And then that was the message, and so... That's, and his wife said there's no way he knew that she was he kept go, she kept going back and forth because that was something that was concealed from him and made a secret from him. Mm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. All right, let's have a look at this conclusion that they've written up here. So this is uh, I don't know who I don't think it's any well-known skeptic or just someone on the internet, but it's all you know every opinion is worth looking at. So con conclusion, I guess this is a conclusion from your whole study. <coughs> Right, um, I agree that there should be done some research on near-death experiences, but I think that she is biased and will always represent the believer's side of the discussion. I'm not here to judge or slender, slander her, but I am sick that people who are interested in near-death experiences are only believers mostly. This is, this is not good because they interpret it in the light of their belief systems. Okay, he's missed the point here entirely, hasn't he? As for the near-death experiences, I think they point out something, but I doubt that it is the afterlife. I think it only shows that the brain can get informations or store them where in a deep, when in a deep state. It's premature to conclude that a soul is going on. Uh, I will look more deeply into the near-death experience of patient 11 because I think that if someone else and not a person who has a bias would inspect the case, it would turn out differently, like with all those cases dealing with the supernatural and paranormal. Right, well, he's, it seems he's entirely missed the point there. Yeah, and it's never been about the afterlife, full stop. I've never even mentioned that in my thesis. I've never mentioned it about the soul in my thesis either. So I think he's totally misinterpreted the point of my research, is to have a greater understanding of death and consciousness. And that's what it seems to be showing, is that our current views of consciousness... Mm. Uh, that yeah, I, th I think... I think I think when he says soul and spirit and all that, I think that's just kind of his terminology for consciousness. I don't think he's really at fault there. But in terms of where he says that you're biased and you're, you're a believer already, to me that's... Mm -hmm. No, you're a believer because of the research you did. Absolutely. My research has opened my eyes. That's it, yeah. It, he could go and do his own research. You know, I would really recommend and encourage him to go, train to be a nurse, go and work in intensive care, and then do his own research and come up with his own conclusions. That is what I would recommend, definitely, that he does. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many sceptics on, on this internet nowadays, and it's you can tell that these people have never... They're, they're looking at what people have done, and they're, they're trying actively to debunk it. And they're not ever going to want to go out and find things out themselves. I mean, when I was looking at astral projection and out of body experiences online, and I was getting opinions from people online. It was all, it was all, oh, grow up, ha ha, you're being silly, whatever. You know, it's not true, etc. And I'm saying, have you ever, have you ever done it? Then he said, no, I don't need to. You know, people like that. And you think, well, if you're not going to be willing to go and try it, how the hell can you have a perspective on it? Exactly. That's it. You know, it's about making your own. Do your own research. That's that's the only thing I can say. You know, mm. the best way to approach these things is, if someone says something, doubt it, don't dismiss it, but doubt it. Yeah. Go and have a look. Absolutely. And if you're not if you're not going to go and have a look, yeah. And if you're not yeah. willing to go and have a look, don't tell them they're crazy because they've had something that you're not willing to go and try out yourself. So you don't know. You know. Right. 
I don't know, that's just my opinion. <laughs> okay. So I think that's that can probably about wrap it up. I think we've covered everything, haven't we? Yeah, we have, yeah. It was great. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, Penny. Is there anything okay. we, need a, we need a plug? Have you got any books or anything? I know you've wrote um, Closer to the yeah. Light or something. Was that yours? I've written no, uh, The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences, What is a Near-Death Experience, and The Transformative Power of Near-Death Experiences, and also my, my research, which is an academic book. Um, and then I'll be doing online courses as well in the coming six months or so, hopefully. So, okay. What's the website? Um, www.drpennysartori.com Perfect. Yep, yeah, I'll put that up. Okay. So, yeah, go and check out Penny's books. Lovely lady from, uh, is that a Welsh accent? Yep, from Swansea. Yep, Swansea. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Well, brilliant. thanks for your time, Penny. I appreciate it. It was very interesting. I... It's not. It's nice to hear opinions from professionals. You know, you can hear loads of accounts, but when you hear it from a professional study, yeah. it kind of brings light to it a bit more. Yeah, and it's fascinating. Fascinating doing that work, you know. So I would encourage anyone out there thinking of doing some work, go and do some, do some research into it.